good news, everyone. You're listening to Banal of America Audio. Enjoy. Since I didn't even have really known that Robertson and Alvarez and some of these other guys were involved with the Foo Fighter investigation during World War II, I presume that that wasn't known at the time either. It wasn't like they established the Robertson panel and they were like, we're going to put these guys in charge. Don't worry. They... They handled similar situations in World War II. Was it more sort of a coincidence, uh, if you will, wink, wink? I don't think it was a coincidence who they picked to form that panel. I think some of the people were. I think that it was well orchestrated by the CIA because the media was just inundated with these sightings, and it was just out of hand. And if anyone is going to know about the, you know, if the governments are, are experiencing a phenomenon and they don't know what it is, they just know more than the public, they had to have some of the guys who really had more of a clue, and these guys were on the Robertson panel. I believe Galsmith, Robertson, and Alvarez were key. Griggs wasn't asked to be there, and even though he was the, he was further up the chain, I believe that Griggs was he was listed as the most knowledgeable in the report, as the most knowledgeable of the Foo Fighters. Where was Griggs? Griggs was the first employee of. Project RAND. Project RAND became the RAND Corporation in 1948. Mm -hmm. And it was General uh, Arnold who set Project RAND in motion with the Douglas Aircraft Company. We had to realize these men were radar experts, so they were looking at it as they were aircraft. And then you just have to say, okay, what kind of aircraft? Extraterrestrial or highly unconventional. So that's where where it sits. So when that Robertson panel met, they had a real working knowledge of the subject. They were seeing what was taking place in the lower ranks, and they were trying to guide us. We, you know, there was an actual beginning of a debunking program where it was going from '53 on. It just it was going to go undercover from here on out as much as possible. Uh, I was being sarcastic in the sense that, like, you know, when they established the Robertson panel, they didn't say, "Oh, don't worry, because we're putting the." the people who handled this sort of thing during the war in charge. Like, the, the, oh, the people didn't have any idea that absolutely. was going. Especially since the, the report wasn't released till uh, FOIA, I think, 74. Uh, and I think the actual, no, I'm sorry. It was uh, in the conclusion of the University of Colorado, the Condon Report. I think it mentioned it, a very watered-down Robertson Panel report. Since then, more has come to light with FOIA. But, yeah, the general public had no clue, and it wasn't supposed to to a certain extent, and uh, those they were not household names, yeah. and that's why they were never really, unfortunately, they passed away before anyone with a serious research uh, capability could go after them. Mm-hmm. McDonald's, think, you know, I'm glad he was able to do that. Yeah. Look how he was. He was such a persistent, intense uh, person in terms of going after the, the truth. Now, we know about all these... Uh Obviously, uh, we obviously know about all these different sightings and stuff going on during World War II. Did that sort of thing come to an end after World War II, or did it continue on into Korea and future wars? I mean, we don't hear a lot about Foo Fighter sightings from Korean pilots or, you know, pilots who flew during the Korean conflict and Vietnam and that kind of thing. Or maybe uh, at that point everything was already so well set up that those sort of reports don't get out. I don't know, but that's what I'm asking you. Um, what's the situation with Foo Fighters post-World War II? Because uh, as people would be led to believe, you know, that it was just a World War II anomaly and that was it, and then it ended, then UFO started. But um, what I'm asking is, uh, you know, combat pilot type of things, did they have their own Foo Fighter sightings in future wars? Yes, absolutely. The sightings did not stop. The big term that came out, was in 46 where they were beco- they were being called ghost rockets at the time. And that was, they were again over Turkey, all over Europe, Scandinavia, and what they w- believed they were were Russian, the Russians were sending V2 captured, uh, V2 rockets or whatever ordnance out, you know, in test flights. Mm-hmm. But the problem is they couldn't find them. If they did, they found one, but there was never any clear cut explanation of what they were even though they were suspected to be a Russian, you know, exploitation uh, program that was in place, and for some reason they were launching all these rockets, which were in the, I think, the thousands, which made no sense in itself. And reports of UFOs were seen during the Korean conflict in Vietnam. However, I have seen no documentation personally. I think Dr. Richard Haynes, who really has put together an extraordinary compilation of 
their reports by pilots, both airlines and military. He has some, but it's nothing to the degree that we saw during the war. However, most people don't realize the degree, like you said, until this book came out, of how much was being seen. Yeah. And so are the researchers out there hitting Vietnam era? I, I have no, of no one to discuss that. Are you aware of any? No, no. So that doesn't mean it's not there. That's, that's the key, you know. Yeah, exactly. Now, what about commercial pilots? I don't even really. I'm not a. I don't really know much about the history of air flight and all that stuff. So uh, maybe that maybe commercial pilots weren't even that prevalent during uh, the war. But uh, I guess the question I have is, during the era of the war, during World War II, what about commercial pilots? Were the were these sort of Foo Fighters sightings? Well, they only seem to come about during these combat situations or in the in the theater of operation areas, or was this also going on at the time with commercial pilots and that kind of thing? It was uh, commercial pilots during the war. I'm not aware of too much, but however, my book, I completely left out all the civilian sightings around the world. I mean, there were many sightings in the United States uh, by civilians reported of craft operating <laughs> that were not Zeppelins or were not air balloons or appeared to be uh, unknowns, and but they were not in the book. And that's the thing. That's where now, as you ask me, we are definitely dealing with something that really it, it, it leans more towards an extraterrestrial visitation. But again, a lot of these reports came out of the NICAP files, APRO files, and a lot of people wrote into magazines where there, when there was much more publication um, publications on the newsstands. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of the early books, like Frank Edwards, a lot of the people who were really in the 60s digging into the subject, they were pulling in reports that were coming from all over the place during the war. And I believe uh, even Donald Kehoe, when he started investigating, he actually came across the term Foo Fighter. And he did his uh, his investigation. He claims he got hundreds of reports from pilots. So a lot of those pilots in the United States, I am sure, and I think I even had one or two civilian pilot reports that uh, they did encounter things that during the day and night that were definitely like the Foo Fighters. Yeah. And so they do exist, and it, it wasn't just military at all. Mm -hmm. And it was out over ocean, so we have, you know, all types of uh, Navy vessels, just, you know, siding and everything else. Yeah. This one's sort of like a big, a really big picture question, you could say. I guess uh, one of the prevalent sort of theories involved with the UFO phenomenon is that, you know, uh, humans began nuclear testing, and that's what attracted the UFOs. Obviously, this uh, the Foo Fighter phenomenon sort of flies in the face to that theory in the sense that, as far as I can tell, they, they were going on way before we started tinkering with the nuclear testing and that kind of thing. So they, they obviously had been here before that. What's your take on that whole scenario, and, and what's your take on the idea that nuclear testing attracted the UFOs, but this Foo Fighter thing was going on before that, so that, that, might, uh, that might nix that theory? I think it does, exactly. And when I first encountered that theory, it was through Leonard Stringfield. He truly believed that the... Uh, the testing of the atomic bomb at in Trinity site in the desert was the calling card for the UFO. He thought that that actually brought visitation. He thought that's what it was. And I found that very interesting because, of course, we know he was in the intelligence capacity with the Fifth Air Force moving in to Japan after the war where he had a sighting. He was aware of Foo Fighter reports through intelligence memoranda. That was it. Mm -hmm. And he was, un unfortunately, we never uh, were able to... Uh, talk about this because he uh, died in 93, I believe. So he had no clue to the extent of what was being seen by the military and the fact that just because they were showing up at the nuclear facilities didn't mean that they were exclusive. It was, you know, of course they're going to show up there, but they were being seen everywhere. And there is a degree of plausibility that because it is a nuclear facility that is drawing the attention of the UFO. And that's where people believe, well, if it was, if it is extraterrestrial visitation, that would be a very logical source to investigate. Yeah. But uh, I don't think that that has anything to do with the subject because it goes back too far mm -hmm. before anything ever happened. Yeah, because it seems like not only uh, the Foo Fighters, but the, the airships that you talk about that were flying over Europe and stuff way like in the early 30s and the 30s and stuff like that. That was way before 
we started tinkering around nuclear weapons and stuff, right? Right. Absolutely. So it's it's just uh, it's a massive, and I really wish I could be able to speak, uh, you know, and completely feel confident that my peers haven't uncovered more information, like the researchers in Sweden or Italy and everything. Unfortunately, there's no communication among us to clarify, to enhance what I've brought forth. Mm -hmm. So by no means, what I've been talking about on your show, has there been any kind of conclusion? This is a work in progress. Oh, totally. And I am totally aware and I will totally accept any type of flaw that I've that I have presented in my book and rectify that. But the, the fact is, it needs to be done. There needs to be a worldwide type of organization to bring all this together, as we all know. Just on the war, I would love to see that, because I'm sure there is just as much sitting in these other countries that would just, it would just be mind-boggling, the, the amount of information that was occurring. And you'd have to say, well, you know, it can't be German technology to account for a worldwide type of uh, sightings like this. There's no way. And you kind of touched on this a little bit, but there's not like a Keith Chester out there in Germany or England that's that's doing the Foo Fighter investigation uh, from that side, or Russia, from that side of of, uh, of the of the Atlantic, right? Have you heard from anybody from, from those parts of the world that have checked out the book or have checked out your research and said, you know, oh, here's a bunch of stuff that you should consider or whatever? No, and no one's contacted me at all. I was hoping that's what would take place, but it only came out in May of this year. So, yeah. uh, you know, many people can't read English who, who probably are aware of the book and they're, they're waiting for a translation of the book. I don't know, and I can't, of course, I can't speak German, I can't speak Russian or anything, so there's a barrier there, and I'm sure there's people out there who have researched this just as in depth in other countries. Mm -hmm. You should talk to, uh, Paul Stonehill. I know the name somewhere, yes. Yeah, you should check out, uh, he might, he might have some insight into all okay. that. Like you said, the book just sort of came out, so you probably sort of, uh, maybe getting feedback, like trickling in, but have you, even prior to that, when you're doing your investigation, did you talk to a lot of, of, uh, of veterans who were in the war and who saw the Foo Fighters and, and sort of, are they, did their testimonies sort of like peak out in the, uh, when they came back from the war in the 50s and 60s or whatever and the UFO phenomenon got really big? Um, then they maybe came out and talked about it, but now it's not so much, and you're not hearing so much. And we talk about Roswell and the race with the Undertaker. Of course, that's going on here with the World War II veterans. Um, you know, the greatest generation, they're, they're dying out. Um, so their, their testimonies are sort of, uh, being taken to the grave. Um, so I guess just talk a little bit about, uh, have you talked to a lot of veterans who saw these sort of things and are they still coming forward or is that kind of petering out? It's petering out because of the age factor. Mm -hmm. You know, there is definitely a problem. Yeah, 1,500, uh, I believe they did an estimate of 1,500 veterans a day from World War II are passing away. Oh, wow. Day. And it's, it's pretty startling. I, I had interviewed probably a good 10 veterans for my book. I think there's only two that are capable of discussing anything with me. Most have passed on or are in such poor health they can't even remember. And it's it's very uh, it's very sad. Yeah. And I attended just recently last month a uh, night fighter reunion in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And you know, surprisingly, about I guess 75 people showed up to that. And so there's about 30 pilots. And uh, Mr. Augsburger, who is commanding officer of the 415th, he's very sharp, still getting around. And you know, he, we talked about his sighting, but he was the only one there. A, lot, a couple of the guys had heard of the Foo Fighters. Not all the guys did until after the war. But they, so much has changed in just 10 years. I think we have seen the best that we're going to see in terms of documentation. Fortunately, I believe the BBC, uh, some other people who, who are documentarians, they have put together good interviews. Many people don't know this, but some of the best research on World War II that I'm aware of, came out of a, a gentleman named Jeff Lindell. Jeff Lindell was, I believe, the University of Indiana about 1991, the same time I did, I started my research with uh, Lynn Stringfield. Mm -hmm. He was writing the thesis of his, um, uh, his college thesis, and it was about folklore. And the Foo Fighters came up, so he was determined to find out what took place and to show that it was mythological 
underpinnings, and it was nothing but misidentifications, mythology, you name it. He was under the impression that it was definitely an optical illusion, uh, according to his sources. But what's key to Jeff Lindell's research is he interviewed dozens upon dozens of veterans in the early 90s and recorded hundreds of hours of interviews. Oh, wow. He did archival research. He had a lot of great documentation. He undercovered a project that was conducted by the United States Navy uh, in July of 1945 and continued on for 10 years that had to do with the eye and how that even the best pilots were going to uh, suffer from some type of, uh, I guess, illusion. Even uh, even though that they were very capable and very sharp and had great eyesight, so he tended to believe that that's what that was. But the fact is, he did this great research. He brought forth a lot of material. You might find a little a couple of his papers on the net, but he is totally reclusive. He will not speak about it. He will not give his files to anyone in the ufological ufological uh, research areas. It's a real frustration. Oh wow! And. Um, he has some key, key information. I have a lot of what he had, but there was, it's his interviews when he got to speak with these guys, you know, when they were so much younger and fresh. And, uh, also, one of the, the, I guess the largest researchers of the Foo Fighters in England was a, a researcher named Andy Roberts. Andy Roberts and Dr. David Clark are co-authors on, from Out of the Shadows, I believe, uh, came out is the British, uh, archives research that they conducted. Anyway, uh, Andy Roberts, prior to that, was very involved in uh, Foo Fighter research, and he had a, like a, a questionnaire form, and he talked with many pilots and wrote many letters, and he did archival research at the war, at the archives there in uh, England. And But unfortunately, nothing was published, and a lot of his records went to Jan Aldrich and Barry Greenwood, of which I was able to bring in and utilize. Uh, so there were, the, right there are two people that I'm aware of that are working behind the scenes that many people will never hear of. And a lot of this documentation, I'm afraid, will go, especially with Lundell, I'm, a, I'm afraid that it will just pass on with him. Yeah. And uh, Why is he so uh, anti, anti-UFO or helping out the UFO people or sharing his information? Does he ever sort of let on to that sort of thing, or is it just because he's, you know, one of those hardcore non-believers? Uh, I think he, he's with the, he is an analyst with the United States Air Force. I don't know if he still uh-huh. is, but he uh, he's convinced from his research that it was definitely something that was not attributed to anything but uh, misidentification. And uh, he had none of the extraordinary reports that I talk about. It, this is strictly just some of the military officers and uh, pilots. So yeah. He was dealing nothing but the military, but he has to remember that the level of the rank also had something to do with it. Just because he was talking with a major with it, who was, you know, getting these reports in didn't mean that major was in the know. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it was a misidentification of a sighting that was probably a rocket. That's what he thought it was, but higher headquarters knew better. Yeah. So it was, you know, that's the flaw there in that type of research. He didn't branch out to the civilian side at all. So, yeah, how many of those guys are out there? I, I think there's a lot more than we realize. And what about second-generation type stories, uh, people, you know, sharing stories that they heard from their parents and stuff when they were in the war? Do you get much of that kind of thing? No, I came across very little of that. Other huh. than when I would contact, like, uh, some of the pilots, I'd end up finding out what they had passed on, and the son would tell me what he knew about hearing his father talk about it. Yeah. But it was, that was what it was all about there. Yeah, and that's hard as it is because you can't really, yeah. there's not much you can ask a follow up. All right, just to sort of wrap things up, put a big bow on the whole subject, uh, you dedicate the book to Len Stringfield, your mentor. Talk a little bit about Len Stringfield. He's one of the really important people in the history of ufology. And uh, as we've pointed out a lot of times on this program, uh, ufology really, uh, its history is sort of nebulous and it doesn't have much of a, there's not too many people carrying on the history of ufology and talking about some of the key players with the exception of some guys, you know, like Heineck and James McDonald. Talk a little bit about Len Stringfield and his role in, in helping you out and, and his role in shaping ufology. Well, as I said, when I first encountered or I first was able to speak with Len, it was in 1989, and I knew a basic background of what he was involved with. I knew his uh, research efforts and his uh, connection to the UFO field extended back into the early 50s. 
Uh, he was very active, um, you know, as far as reporting. And uh, so when I did contact him, he was dedicated to, of course, crash and retrieval research, mm -hmm. which, you know, that took up that whole decade until he passed on. And so dealing with him on that, he was really able to guide me, and he took a real interest in in helping me. It wasn't like we came became fast friends. And it was, we talked about everything, uh, yeah. the weather, his health, uh, flowers, you know, what he liked, his many theories. He, he truly thought that there was a, a great deal of extraterrestrial visitation and manipulation. He would always let you know that he was speculating. He never went over the deep end. He only he would only report what he knew. He, he respected everyone's story in terms. But if someone said that they, did, they didn't want their name out, that name was not getting out. To this day, his records remain within the family, never to be released. Oh wow! Uh, I still talk to his wife regularly, uh, Del Stringfield, and she felt that Len released everything to the public that he felt was pertinent. As far as finding out the names of the, of the sources, she that was a you know a break of confidentiality that Len would not want and may jeopardize the family members or that particular person in the in the near future mm -hmm. that would get out. So those files remain buried and they won't ever see the light of day. I just I wanted to find out from her if she was going to destroy them. She said no. At one time they thought about that. But they decided to keep it in the family because one of the daughters is a writer, and they want to write a, bio a biography about her dad. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. However, I don't know the extent of her knowledge regarding <laughs> yeah. what he knew and what he was like. But he uh, he definitely helped me along the way with with that uh, teacher case I discussed early in the show, and told me what to say, how to say it. He helped me with my interview techniques, which I really had no clue. And he, he tried to teach me how to listen. Listen, get it all down, go back, get your next set of questions up, and then correlate. Yeah. And he was very good at that. And, uh, of course, he started putting out his monographs. He told me never write a book. <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't write a book. It was the worst experience he ever had when he wrote Situation Red in the 70s. I don't know why. I never really figured that out. But he, he said it was just too too much of a horrendous project. So I didn't take his advice on that. <laughs> and uh, but he was a, he was a great guy. He's very significant to the history of ufology because he was one of the people who was in his 1957 book Three Zero Blue, where he was an actual point of contact for the Air Force in terms of he was a ground filter uh, center. If UFO signs were coming in, he could determine they were something very unique. He could place the call to get a fighter sent up. Oh, wow. And that was a pretty big position to have. And he was well-respected because he was so methodical. He was so – he didn't jump the gun. He reported correctly and accurately. And so I think that the Air Force felt he was a good tool to utilize. I, don't, I can't remember how many years that took place. It might have been two years and, of course, he started his own uh, newsletter, uh, Civilian Research Investigation, CIRFO, I can't remember the acronym. Uh, he actually put that out for several years until his wife said, I, no, no more, I don't want to deal with it. So he decided to actually start to compile his cases for the monographs. Uh, that's what led up to that. He, he couldn't really... Uh, do the newsletter, so he put out Three Zero Blue, his first publication, 57. Then he wrote his first book, Situation Red. And then, of course, the monographs came later. So he's very, very influential. He's part of the Roswell scene. He was one of the first people to interview Jesse Marcel. He was able to get that whole slew of original witnesses that came forward. Uh, Pappy Henderson, the B-29 pilot who flew the wreckage to right field, allegedly. He was able to interrogate them, not interrogate, but interview them in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, before it, uh, Kevin Randall jumped into the field, mm -hmm. and uh, Bill Moore, and, uh, Charles Berlitz, and Don Schmidt. Now we have a whole a whole army of, of researchers. Many, many are, 
are great researchers to the field, but it was really Len was one of the pioneers of that. It sounded like he really, uh, the grandfather of the crash saucer investigation because of so much, uh, information that he had. Yeah, I asked him, I, I said, well, I don't understand why you? Why are so many doctors coming to you and personnel coming to you? And he said, well, it, he happened to be at the right place at the right time. People had seen some of his publications, maybe heard him speak when he was out, you know, lecturing for MUFON conventions and things like that. He said that most of the people were coming to him only because they had no other way to talk about it. Yeah. To let someone else know. They couldn't, some, in, in many instances, they couldn't even tell their family, uh, because the family was at jeopardy because of that type of pressure allegedly put on these people by government and military officials to keep, keep it quiet. So he was, you know, like a, a psychiatrist or psychologist, you know, a radio show where you're calling in Dr. Frazier. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, so he, he was able to accumulate some great stuff. However, many fault him because it can't be verified. So I'm sorry that that exists out there, but uh, he was a very, a very honorable man, and his research uh, ethics were top notch. Mm -hmm. um, now you said he shared. Theories with you, like what kind of, you know, what, what did he think about the UFO phenomenon? What was his take on it? He had been in it for so long, you know, what, what kind of conclusions had he come to? And I'm sure he had all kinds of sources and that kind of thing too. Well, his primary theory was uh, that the atomic bomb was of such significance that if anything was here, it was a indication that human civilization was heading towards disaster, and that brought about more investigation or research by the entities of another civilization from another world. Mm -hmm. Basically, that is in a nutshell what he thought. And from there, it just has bloomed that we ha are seeing more and more of of this taking place, that we were seeing an increase in, let's say, the abduction because it had reached a certain point. At first, it was probably just probes that were coming here, and then more craft showed up, and more research were being conducted on us as as if like cattle. And of course, many people took off with that aspect. Yeah. Uh, where we're being treated like tag deer or cattle in the wild. So he pretty much didn't um, go from there. However, as the years went on, he would take theories that, you know, was Dr. Jacques Follet, the uh, ultra-dimensional or the the aspect where it's an intelligence that has been with human civilization forever, that is progressing with us technologically as an experiment, maybe manipulating our, our existence, our development, evolution, who knows. But he started to entertain the more esoteric theories. He, he didn't disregard them, but he really thought, the bottom line, he really thought that it was a nuts and bolts situation that we were encountering. That it was as simple as an aircraft from another planet, but because of the advanced aspects of that, it was bordering into the uh, paranormal. Mm -hmm. So that was the multifaceted, so it couldn't be ignored. But he really felt it was strictly a nuts and bolts when it came down to a situation that it, that whoever or whatever it is was capable of, uh, of presenting itself where we can't get a clue to, to what's taking place. Yeah. Now, did he ever share uh, his thoughts on what the government might have known about the UFO phenomenon? Because it sounds like if, if he had the ability to call up jet fighters and have them out there, uh, he must have had some indication on how they, at least how they felt about it. Um, did he did he ever sort of like, you know, give you any indication of what he thought the government knew about the UFO phenomenon? Well, unlike Kehoe, who had real extensive ties to higher military uh, rank, he was in communication through the years with military officers or personnel that said, you, we're dealing with a phenomenon that can't be explained. So he knew that much. And he was able to convince himself through those kinds of connections that the government was well aware of what was taking place. The problem was he wasn't convinced the government had an answer, which I'm not sure they do either. Yeah. He, he just, he was just sure that it was so, such a profound issue he would devote his life to that research because it was fascinating to him. He couldn't let it go. And what did he think of the world of ufology? Because, uh, you know, some people, they're in the field for a long time. They kind of get burned out, and, you know, with the infighting and all that. And, you know, they don't want anything to do with it anymore. Was he, 
you know, how, what was his take on how how the, this this uh, you know quasi scientific field had developed uh, since he was in it from the fifties? I mean, from the fifties to the nineties, that's quite an evolution as far as the field goes. Uh, yeah. What was his take on ufology and, and where it was headed and where it had been? He was very open. He but he was not a man to get into the. Uh, the fight, the infighting, mm-hmm. the character assassination, the, the, no, I'm right, you're wrong. No, he was willing to listen to it all, maintain his belief, and he, w- he wanted to learn. He was always wanting to know who was thinking what and why they were thinking it because he, he didn't ever say he had the answer. He was just accumulating information. So he was very much in tune to the u- ufological process that was taking place and very interested. And he just had his certain degree of interest, which were the doctors and the military personnel who actually were handling the entities, the allegedly recovered entities. That fascinated him the most. Now we have a biological entity in our possession. Is that true? Well, it seems to be because I have a couple doctors who know, do not know each other and are aware that of these situations, their facts are correlating. And so he started to see that and really, really feel he was onto something. But he was totally, uh, Jacques Vallée, of course, we know, went on to a different realm. He totally followed the works of him. He followed, um, of course, Richard Hall and all the big ones. I don't think there was one researcher that he was not aware of that he was more than willing to hear them, debate them talk with them and listen to them because he'd be willing to change his point of view but his research was showing something that that's why the crash and retrieval became so important to him he realized that hey there's something more to it here and I'll let those other guys take care of their little niche like Linda Bolton Howe at the time was heavily into the cattle mutilation so that in itself was fascinating because there was a whole ball game of people thinking that it was being conducted by some advanced research project agency out of the Army or the Navy and under the guise of a flying saucer, they were using laser technology or whatever, electromagnetic pulse, whatever it was that he felt some realms were thinking that. And he would actually say, yeah, that's a good idea and, and welcome that into his, his uh, ideas. So if you're asking about his character, what it was like, how he felt, he was the kind of researcher that we definitely need more of. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. And I, I wish, uh, I wish the field of ufology had more, you know, had mo- had a better memory. I guess you could say of, of some of the players that were in the field and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, that'll come about in the future. I have no doubt. I think there are, there are people. They may have not made their mark, or they're not prevalent. I think what you know. I hope it doesn't. You know, you have a few voices in the field that seem to dominate, but that it, time will tell. New research, new books will come out, and uh, the older generation will be rediscovered for what it was and the value it offered to the field of today. History repeats itself. You can't go on without knowing your history. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the history, you'll be able to reevaluate the whole scenario with today's information and see a correlation if it's there or not. Yeah. And uh, so I have, I'm optimistic, very optimistic that there's a lot more to come. There will be other string fields. There will be more Don Berliners, Bruce McAvees. There will be more Jerome Clarks. There will be, we'll see a whole new generation of those. What's next for you? What do you have coming on down the pike? Um, any speaking engagements you want to mention or, or uh, you know, any plans for future books and stuff like that? Or, or what's coming up, you know, in the end of 2007, 2008 for Keith Chester? Well, I have not stopped researching. Um, I've been going to the archives weekly. I'm still delving into World War II. I'm going to stay in that niche. It just is some the war fascinates me and now that I found that there was a phenomenon involved in it, it's even more spellbinding. And my my books are so many holes and unanswered questions, I I just want to keep going with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping now that I can connect with an international uh, at least establish an international dialogue. And I would love to see one day be able to travel to Germany yeah. uh, and checking their archives out or going to England. So I'd like to expand on that. And I do have another book in the works that will be with World War II. However, the way I work is I put down a theory and I say, okay, is that possible? Let's hunt the records to see if it is. And that's exactly how my 
book came about here in terms of I needed the documentation. And it was there, it presented itself to me. And I was like, okay, I uncovered all the generalized and how our office documents. So it showed there was really an investigation, more so than uh, just a speculative uh, realm that has been promoted. And now I want to get into the more specifics. I want to learn more about Dr. Griggs. I want to learn more about Dr. Robertson. I want to learn more about uh, what did the American intelligence apparatus extract out of Germany. Was there a flying saucer program? Can we say without a doubt nothing like that existed? With There's just as much information in their ball court as highly speculative or suspicious as that may sound that there are there's these abductions. So it, it's, it really needs to be explored and should not be shut out and we should keep going and I will stay with World War II. That's what I plan to do. My, uh, I have a speaking engagement near Philadelphia in April of 2008 to a very small group. Uh, but as of that, uh, there's nothing on the horizon unless I'm contacted like you and your wonderful show. I mean, you've been great. And I hope to have more of these conversations. And hopefully more people are, are interested. I did find out, I had a rude awakening here with the local press. I live near Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I contacted several times the local papers, the Baltimore Sun. No reply, no interest. Oh, man. And yet they'll... You'll see in one of the local papers where someone wrote about the history of duck decoys or something, and a new author, which is great, and I, I, you know, admire that. But I find that you know, especially with Ken Burns' war documentary on the relationship between a generation and a phenomenon, why would they not take interest? Uh, but there's been no, no one interested. Weird. Uh, you were the first. Well, uh, I appreciate that. I- Thank you very much, and you know, I now am hooked on your show, knowing what you are about, knowing what your show is about, because I've had a chance to research your site, and I apologize for really not having done that prior to our contact with each other, but I'm not a big internet searcher. Um, I didn't do any research hardly at all on the internet, because I felt like I needed to see the sources myself from the real archive sources. Mm -hmm. I can't trust a lot of the documentation up there, you know, if it's for real. Uh, of course, you know, John Greenwood, that may be a different source because he seems to be leading with that kind of situation, as is a couple other things like Project 1947 and NICAP site with Francis Ridge, mm-hmm. you know, a wonderful site for uh, historical documentation, or if you're aware of that. Anyway, so I, uh, I just hope more people contact me, such as yourself, and I really appreciate the time you've given me and the fact that you listen and have asked me questions beyond the, a couple, you know, surface issues. We don't do surface issues here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say, this book is awesome. I, I, I can't put it over enough. Strange Company, Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II. Uh, you've done an invaluable service to the UFO field with this book. Uh, we need more researchers like you. So many people want to just jump into something that's been done to death. Uh, if I see another Roswell book, you know, I'm going to cry. So to, to get my hands on a book that does a thorough examination of a whole realm of ufology that just does not get enough attention, which is, of course, the Foo Fighter phenomenon and all the accompanying uh, phenomena that are a part of that, was just a huge treat to me, and I just loved the book. Is there a website to plug? Unfortunately not. No, okay. I have no website, no. Um, where can people get the book? You can order the book from any bookstore. Uh, you'd have to go in and order it. It's not on the shelf. It's... Uh printed by Anomalous Books, and of course Jerome Clark wrote the foreword, and then again, you can go to Amazon.com, any internet, and just order, just plug, type in the name of the book, my name or whatever, and there you go. It's just It just doesn't physically sit on the bookshelf, but it's available anywhere. That's fine. We're an internet show. People should be able to get a hold of it, um, and they definitely should. It's a, it's a must read for any serious student in the field of ufology. Again, the title of the book is Strange Company. Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II. It is awesome. I highly recommend it. Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show. I had a blast talking to you. I appreciate so much you just giving us so much time and really a thorough look into this phenomenon in the book. And um, I really I just thank you so much for coming on the show and, and, and uh, spending so much time talking to us. 
my pleasure and right back at you. It's a show like yours that's going to get into perspective what the people need to know about the history of the subject and keep it to keep it in check because it's very important history. And uh, the fact that you're doing that puts you a notch above the rest, absolutely. I'm a big fan now, and I will definitely spread the word about you and your show. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. Okay, thank you. That does it for this week's edition of BOA Audio Season 3. Big, big, super huge thanks to Keith Chester for coming on the show and giving us so much time. As we've noted, Keith does not have a website, so I will just go ahead and recommend you pick up Strange Company Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II. It's available via Anomalist Books, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Go to your bookstore, ask them to order it, they'll pick it up for you. It doesn't matter how you do it, but definitely get your hands on a copy of a Strange Company. It is an outstanding book and easily one of the ten best UFO books of 2007. Moving right along, it's time now for BOA Audio listener feedback, and we have a short and sweet letter this week that came relatively recently, but moved to the top of the inbox. It comes from someone billed simply as SAP, under the title of, Thank you, Mr. Been All of America Dude. Here's what SAP has to say. Hey, I discovered you through Red Ice Creations a while back, and I have to say that your style is the illest in the game. Keep it up. Peace from Norway, SAP. Thank you so much for writing in SAP. As I said, it was short and sweet, and it moved to the top of the inbox for the simple, unwritten rule here on listener feedback. International letters always move to the top of the list. We've heard from listeners all over the world, and now we can add Norway to the list. I love hearing from the international listeners, and I am humbled to be told that my style is the illest in the game. Stick around, SAP. The month of December is only going to get iller on BOA Audio. Thanks for writing in. If you want to be a part of BOA Audio listener feedback, either simply go to binallofamerica.com, click the contact button on the left-hand side of the screen, that'll put you on the contact page, or simply write to boaaudio at hotmail.com. Either one of those methods will put your correspondence on the road to BOA Audio listener feedback. Up next, of course, it's time for the thanks portion of the program. Super huge thanks to the fantastic BOA staff, Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Joe V., and Tina Senna. Week in, week out, providing top-notch reading material for the BOA readers and offering me a ton of feedback. They were instrumental in helping us shape the merchandise line that we'll be talking about in just a little bit. But let me give you a little thumbnail on what was going on at BOA this past week. R. Lee had Trickster's Realm under the title of Medley of Weirdness talking about how many different esoteric genres seem to overlap, and how we may be able to find the answer to many paranormal mysteries by looking in those areas of overlap. Leslie's Grey Matters tackled the whiter shade of grey, discussing how many people seem to identify the greys as being grey-skinned, and base this on the Whitley Strieber Communion book, but in reality, the cover of Communion has a tan-slash-greenish color alien, Leslie sort of digs into that mental framework of why people seem to make that incorrect connection between communion and the gray color for the grays. Wrapping up the week is Chiron's K-Files with Destroying the Universe, talking a little bit about the global warming debate and some of the latest news in that regard that has to do with cosmology, dark matter, and a host of other weird and wild stuff. So as you can see, tons of stuff going on at Been All of America this past week. As we say, week in and week out here on the program, if you're only listening to the podcast and you're not reading the columns at BenAllOfAmerica.com, you're only getting half the story. Now, usually is the part of the program where we talk about making donations and how we need your help and support, but over the past couple weeks we've been teasing the new line of VOA merchandise, and I'm happy to report that it is now available for you to check out and hopefully purchase at the VOA store. How can you find the BOA store? That's simple. You go to banallofamerica.com or the page where you got this audio. You'll see the ad flashing the new designs for the BOA merchandise. I've been working on it for over a month now with a very talented artist. goes by the name of Circle Dancer. 
I'm sure it was definitely trying for Circle Dancer to work with me because I was always hitting on the little points. I want this changed. I want this moved an inch. It was a little crazy at times, and I thank Circle Dancer for her patience and hard work over the last month in putting these designs together. What are the designs? UFOs are real. Get over it. I believe in Bigfoot. Aliens built the pyramids, and one that is very popular, it seems, already, Stonehenge, was an inside job. These are the kind of merchandise that people will see you wearing. It'll start a conversation about all the different esoteric topics we cover here on the program. Now, when you're wearing the merchandise, you can let your freak flag fly and really engage people in esoterica. In addition to the very cool new VOA line, I got a little something special here for the folks who listen to the end of the program. You're the hardcore listeners, and I want to give back to you a little bit. So I'm going to give you the heads up on a very cool promotional deal that we are going to announce next week on the program, December 8th. But we're going to give you the heads up here on December 1st. Next week's guest is Jeremy Vaney. He has been very generous and donated over 20 copies of his book, I Know Why the Aliens Don't Land. They are going to be part of a little promotion at BOA we're going to call Vaney Mania. And what is Vaney Mania? Pretty much for the next 20 people who buy stuff from the new BOA store, you're going to get a copy of Jeremy Vaney's book as well. Go over to BOA, pick up some merchandise, drop me an email, and say, Hey, I heard about Vaney Mania already via the end of the program. I bought some stuff at the store. Here's my information. And you'll be on the list to receive one of the 20 or so copies of Jeremy Vaney's book. Don't say I never rewarded the folks who stick around here to listen to the end of the program. You are my favorite listeners by far, and as such, you get first crack at Vaney Mania. I've already sort of given away who's coming up next week, but we'll give you a little more preview here. It's Vaney Mania next week on VOA Audio as prolific esoteric pundit Jeremy Vaney joins the program for a freewheeling hour and a half long interview. We'll be discussing the evolution of Jeremy's abduction experience his film, No One's Watching, An Alien Abductee's Story, his entry into the field of esoterica, and his take on ufology from an abductee's point of view. Plus, we'll cover his trip to the X Conference this past September, his book, I Know Why the Aliens Don't Land, Disclosure, Young People in Ufology, and Policing the UFO World. In addition to all that, we'll have some laughs about angels, ass shots, and Alfred Weber's 9-11 theories. And, of course, tons and tons more. That's next week on the program, Vaney Mania, as Jeremy Vaney joins BOA Audio for an extended conversation. And on that note, there's not much left to say, folks. I want to thank you all so much for listening. Until you hear from me next week, this is Tim Benall, signing off.